and get to hear and listen to the word all day. It just doesn't get much better than this. We are blessed. Amen. Well, this is my chapel service where I typically teach on prosperity. And uh, I want you to turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And I'm going to read a few verses, but um, I'm going to share with you what not to do today. 1 Corinthians, Paul had been defending his apostleship and the people had rejected him, some for Cephas, some for Apollos and others, and he had been defending it. And so in the first few verses, he says, if I'm not an apostle to other people, I without a doubt am to you. I'm the one that brought the gospel to you. And they should have respected him for that. And anyway, he, he said in verse two, he says, if I be not an apostle unto others, yet doubtless I am to you for the seal of mine apostleship are ye in the Lord. My answer to them that do examine me is this. Have we not power to eat and to drink? And this is, uh, again, I don't want to spend a lot of time, but he was, uh, people were criticizing him because they weren't keeping all of the Jewish laws or the people who had already received grace were criticizing him because he was keeping the Jewish laws. He was being blasted either way he went. Have we not power to uh, lead about a sister, a wife, as well as other apostles and as the brethren of the Lord and of Cephas, talking about Peter? In other words, he was not married and yet he said we had power to marry, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, he talked about all of that. And then he said, or I, or I only in Barnabas, have we not power to forbear working? Who goeth a warfare anytime at his own charges? Who planteth a vineyard? and eateth not of the fruit thereof, or who feedeth a flock and eateth not of the milk of the flock. He's just basically going to the secular world and says, who works for free? And yet he says, I haven't taken any money from you. Not because he didn't have the power to do. Matter of fact, he even later apologized in 2 Corinthians. He says, the only thing that you were inferior to everybody else is that I just didn't take any money from you. He refused to do it because there was so much rejection and criticism towards uh, people who were preaching the gospel and yet receiving money that he just decided to work and provide not only for himself, but for all of the people that were with him so that he could take away their accusations. And then he says, uh, say I these things as a man or saith not the law the same also. For it is written in the law of Moses, thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Doth God take care for oxen? Of course, the obvious answer is yes. Or saith he it altogether for our sakes. For our sakes, no doubt, it is written that he that ploweth should plow in hope and he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of his hope. So this is just saying that when the Lord, you know, they had a mill, uh, mill thing and they would hook an oxen up to it and the oxen would just walk in a circle and tread out the corn. And anyway, it was a one of, part of the law that you couldn't muzzle the ox. In other words, if the ox was going to do this for you and produce benefit for you, then you had to let the ox eat as much grain as he wanted. The laborer is worthy of his hire is what he's talking about. And he said that this was written not for the oxen's sake, but for us so that when we work, we should receive. And so in verse, uh, <coughs> verse 11, if we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? Absolutely not. This is the way that God set it up. If others be partaker of this power over you, talking about in the secular world, are not we rather blameless? We have not used this power, but suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. And let me just point out that the Corinthian church is, I think there might have been one other church, I'm not sure, but the Corinthian church is e either the only one or one of two churches that Paul refused to receive any offering from. The rest of them, he did receive offerings. Matter of fact, with the Philippians, he even talked about the Philippians in the fourth chapter and said that uh, even after he left the local area, they sent once and again unto him. And when he was in Rome in the 28th chapter of the book of Acts, he was in a uh, hired house they allowed him to hire his own house and he was under arrest. But how does a prisoner pay for his rent? The Philippians helped him. And that's what he talks about in the fourth chapter. They sent twice when he was in Thessalonica. And then when he was in Rome, 
they sent and they helped him and paid his rent. They brought uh, things to him. And so anyway, I'm pointing out that this was an exception. Some people misinterpret this and think that Paul just refused to ever take offerings from the people he ministered to. He, he did this with the Corinthians and later in 2 Corinthians, he apologized and he says, the only thing you were inferior to other people is that I didn't give you an opportunity to give. But he did it for a specific reason. And so he says in verse 13, do ye not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple? Talking about the priest. And they that wait at the altar are partakers with the altar. For those of you that don't know, when they brought sacrifice, the shoulder, and I forget all of the parts, but there were certain parts of the animal that they sacrificed, but then they belonged to the priest. And this is how the priest fed himself and his family and all of the Levites. They took a portion of the altar, not only of the meat offerings, but all of the drink offerings, all of the meal offerings and things like this. This is how they were sustained. So that's what he's referring to. And so in verse 14, even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. But I have used none of these things, neither have I written these things that it should be so done unto me for it were better for me to die than that any man should take should make my glory in void. And then he goes on and talks about because he didn't volunteer for this job. He was arrested on the way to Damascus and it was either serve me or I'm going to kill you. And so he's basically saying the only reward he has is to uh, serve the Lord and make the gospel uh, available to people free. But I'm reading these verses to show that the scriptures say, like right here in verse 14, even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. And I want to share with you some of my mistakes. You know, by the grace of God, I haven't gone out and committed adultery. I haven't gotten in, you know, big trouble. I hadn't done, I hadn't stole money. I've lived a great life. But boy, an area that I missed it big time in was this area of finances. And I was taught, I'm not going to tell you who, but they taught very clearly that if you are called to the ministry, you're sinning against God if you go work a secular job because you're called to the ministry and you aren't, uh, you aren't being faithful to what God called you to do. And so because of that, my heart was right, but uh, I just refused to work. And because of it, man, we suffered. A lot, and so I'm going to share. I'm going to share some testimony with you today. Today is my oldest son's 49th birthday, and I remember his birthday very well because Jamie and I were really, really struggling financially. You know, I didn't realize it when I grew up, but I really grew up very well off. I was probably considered wealthy, but it, you know, it didn't dawn on me. I never thought about it. But uh, when I had my experience with the Lord, I went to Vietnam. When I got back from Vietnam, uh, I was a uh, youth director at a little Baptist church. And anyway, about, I think it was four and a half years after that first experience is when Jamie and I got married. And that's a great story. God spoke to us and we were engaged to be married before we ever held hands. God just supernaturally put us together. So we got married on October the 27th. Uh, 1972 and I was pouring concrete at the time but when we got married there it was a lot of things happened and God just told me it was time for me to start my ministry so um, anyway this is dumber than a hammer I, I apologize I am not telling you what to do I'm telling you what not to do hopefully this might help you you know, you can learn things the negative way. And so uh, anyway, Jamie and I got married October 27, 1972. We took a week honeymoon, came up here to Colorado. Both of us just were believing God that someday we'd get to live in Colorado. And after we got back to the Dallas area, I took $5,000. I had $5,000 in the bank. I took it all out in $100 bills and went down to the 7-Eleven store and just started passing out $100 bills and gave them all away. I couldn't wait to get to where I was just trusting God instead of having my own money. How dumb can you get and still breathe? 
And let me say, I'm going to be giving a lot of stories that you'll wonder how Jamie ever tolerated me. <laughs> Jamie never one time ever complained. Never. And she went through a lot of stuff. And she didn't agree with me. And, uh, but she never complained. And I was so fragile at that time. If Jamie would have come out and criticized me, it might have done me in. I don't know. But man, what a blessing. She just stuck with me through thick and thin. So anyway, we had already rented a little apartment in Dallas and had paid the first month's rent. And then I gave all of this money away. And I think we lasted a month or two. I was holding Bible studies and doing a few things. And every once in a while, I get a little bit of money. So we lasted a month or two. But uh, then we ran out of money. And we didn't buy groceries and do things like that. If we couldn't pay our bills, we'd pay our bills before we had eaten. So Jamie and I had gone weeks without eating. And uh, anyway, I could give you a lot of stories about that. And after just a few months, um, we got an eviction notice that we were going to be evicted in the next morning. And man, this really uh, weighed on us. And we drove over to a meeting in Greenville, Texas, which was about an hour away and heard a man, Jack Taylor, preach. And he preached this message on Moses. Matter of fact, I'm going to be teaching that message over in second year today. I learned these things through Jack Taylor. But anyway, he was teaching about how Moses had authority and how he had to use it. And it really touched me. So after the meeting, I went up and asked Jack Taylor to pray with me, told him we were being evicted in the morning. And uh, all the way over there, Jamie and I sang this Psalms from Psalms uh, 27, 1, the Lord is my light and my salvation. We sang that all the way over there and back. And we were going to be evicted in the morning. And so anyway, when we got home, uh, Jack Taylor had been saying that, man, you've got authority. If you have to, you could lay hands on a chair and turn it into money. So we had a little folding chair. We didn't have much. We didn't even have all the furniture, but I laid hands on this folding chair and commanded it to turn into money if necessary. But we were going to have our needs by in the morning. So anyway, at three o'clock in the morning, my brother-in-law knocks on the door. He lived about two and a half hours away. And my brother-in-law comes and knocks on the door. And again, I could spend the whole rest of this time explaining what a miracle this was. But my brother-in-law, he loved me. We had a good relationship, but he thought I was absolutely crazy. And he was against everything I was doing and the way that I had given my money away and that way I wasn't working. He was just, he was on me like a chicken on a June bug about how bad all of this was. And he disagreed with everything. So anyway, he showed up at three in the morning and so I invited him in. He just sat down and started shooting the breeze. And I said, Leon, I said, why are you here? And he says, don't ask me any questions. He says, but if I've ever heard God in my life, God told me to come and give you this. And it was a $165 check, which is exactly what we had to have. We had to have... Uh, I forget the exact amount of the rent, but anyway, that allowed us to give all five. And that's what Jamie and I were praying for was $165. And so he gave it to us and left. And that was a bigger miracle than if he had turned that chair into money. <laughs> I could spend a lot of time explaining that, but I mean, that was God. But that's the way that we lived was just by crisis to crisis. We were facing eviction. We would go a week without eating. I remember uh, the very first uh, uh, Valentine's Day that Jamie and I were married. We'd gone over a week without eating and I came home and Jamie had saved a little bit of cake mix. When I say that we were without food, some people mean that they don't have a regular meal. You have to eat your canned stuff or something. Jamie and I, all we had, we had some salt that we kept in the freezer or in the refrigerator to keep it from clumping up and that was it. We had a deal of salt and water came with the apartment and that's all we had. And we had been over a week and I came home from someplace and Jamie had saved a little bit of cake mix and just had made a real simple cake and put uh, red hots on it in the shape of a heart saying, I love you. And she showed me that cake and I walked in and she had that and I said, you've been holding out. We had food and we haven't eaten. And her 
countenance just changed from, you know, and she, she didn't say a word. She just walked off. And boy, I mean, I got in the car, I was going someplace and God got on my case and said, don't you ever talk to my daughter like that again. And man, I had to go back and apologize. I never observed Valentine's Day. I, we, our family never observed birthdays. All we did, my brother would give me licks. And if uh, I was 10 years old, he'd give me 10 licks and one to grow on. And we didn't give presents. We didn't have cakes. We didn't do that stuff. But boy, Jamie's family celebrated everything. So I had to learn to change and accommodate the way that she did things. But anyway, this is just to describe to you how bad things were. And so right uh, when Jamie and I got married, we only lasted like six months in that apartment before we finally just had to leave and uh, move in with my mother and this other couple, Mike and, I mean, Mar uh, man, Marshall and Cindy Townsley, uh, they just came with us and we moved in with my mother. And my mother had an entire seven years supply of tuna fish for the <laughs> tribulation period. Pat Robertson had been telling people. And we ate nearly all of her seven years supply. We ate tuna fish day and night. And she knew what was going on. But anyway, we were living with my mother and didn't have enough money for anything. And uh, so this is not the way it's supposed to be. This was a terrible start to our marriage. And then uh, I would, when we were in that little apartment in Dallas for about six months, it wasn't wasted time because what I'd do, I'd get up every morning and I had uh, three or four legal uh, yellow pads that I just wrote down scripture references. Not the whole scripture, but just where the reference was. Front and back scriptures that God was speaking to me. And I, would, I had about four pages of that front and back. There was maybe a thousand scriptures that I get were just speaking to me. And then during the day, I'd sit down and with a legal pad, I would write out those scriptures longhand and just meditate on every word. And I did that for six months and I'd do that about 10 hours a day. And then I'd go into our closet. We had a one bedroom <coughs> apartment and I'd actually go into the closet and it was just big and it was just a typical closet. It wasn't walk-in closet. And I would sit in there and pray in tongues for two or three hours over these scriptures. God, what does this mean? And I did, that was my whole thing for about six months it was about 10 hours a day studying and then praying in tongues an hour or two. And anyway, when we left there, finally didn't have any money, had to move in with my mother. And uh, I mean, it's like an atomic bomb went off on the inside of me. Everything that I'm basically teaching today, God showed me back in 1973 in a, some kind of a form. And I've gotten a lot of understanding, but it wasn't wasted time. So I was in the word and there were some good things happening, but I should have been, should have been working. And I wasn't. And so when we were at my mother's house, man, I'd, I would sit and pray in tongues and look at the phone. This is before we had phones that you could carry with you. They were attached to the wall. And I would sit there and pray in tongues and look at that phone and command it to ring. And anyway, <laughs> one day the phone rang and it was a guy I had met two or three years before at a Bible study. I wasn't even ministering. We were just sitting together at a Bible study and we had changed phone numbers and God just kind of hit it off. And so anyway, he was from Seagaville, Texas, and he was the youth director at a Baptist church. And out of the blue, three years later, after meeting him one time, he just called me and he said, would you come speak for our uh, retreat for these young people? in uh, the Baptist church. And, I, and man, I, I didn't even have to say, well, let me pray about it and see you. Man, I, I was praying for an opportunity. And so when he asked, I said, absolutely. So anyway, I went there and ministered and out of 45 kids, we saw 43 receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And it was awesome. But when they got back to Seagaville, the Baptist pastor said that this was all of the devil, started preaching it against. He called all of those kids in with their parents and said, this is the devil, you've got to renounce that. And all but three of the kids renounced it so that they could stay in that church. And the few who stuck with it uh, were just calling me and saying, what can we do? So I started going over to Seagaville and holding Bible studies and eventually they said, would you please come here and just help us? And so Jamie and I took a step of faith and moved 
to Sigaville with this other couple that was living with my mother. They got their own house. We got our own house. It was a dump. It was terrible. But we moved there by faith. I pray, I paid about two or three months rent, but I couldn't keep it up. And eventually we had to leave there and we moved in with Jamie's parents. And this is when Jamie was pregnant. And anyway, long story, but I was pastoring this little church in Seagaville and we had anywhere from six to 10 people. And three of them were me and Jamie and our son after he was born and the other couple. So five of us were there every time and every once in a while we'd have two or three people come. And I was refusing to work. We were struggling financially. So anyway, um, we had to, well, before we moved in with Jamie's parents, it was just uh, six weeks before my firstborn was supposed to be born and um, we went two weeks with zero food, nothing but just water. Jamie, eight months pregnant. Again, I'm not saying these things so that anybody would do this. I'm saying that th this is one of the biggest mistakes I ever made in my life and it, and it uh, was bad. And anyway, she went two weeks with zero food and uh, Joshua is getting time for him to be born and it was gonna be $600 for the uh, birth which some people might think that's really cheap now, but back then when you have zero money coming in, it was impossible. And anyway, one, one night, we met five times a week. And one night we went over to this lady's house that was in the church and I was supposed to be ministering. I was the pastor and I just told them, I said, look, I can't minister to anybody. I need you to minister to me. And they just all laughed like, oh no. They, they just didn't th take me seriously. And I said, I'm serious. I said, I, I need you to pray for me. And they didn't know what to do. So they just turned on the 700 Club. And we were all sitting there watching the 700 Club. And Kenneth Copeland happened to be hosting. And Kenneth Copeland was preaching out of 1 John 5, 4. And it says, this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. And I didn't say these things out loud, but I was thinking to myself, I thought, Kenneth, I've tried this. And it hadn't worked. And he just said, now don't try it, just do it. <laughs> and, I, and I said, well, I have been doing it, but I said, it's not working. And he said, don't you dare say it's not working. And every thought that I had, he countered those thoughts. And I mean, it was just like somebody slapping me. And, and so I determined that, all right, I'm gonna stand and I'm gonna fight until it's over. And, um, so anyway, we were trying to believe God. We had to leave Seagaville and move back in with Jamie's parents, which was an hour away. And we were living with them when Joshua was born and uh, mooching off of them. And anyway, it was at 520 in the morning when Jamie's water broke. And so we started to the um, uh, hospital and I was out of gas. And I had to pray over that car to get her to the hospital. We just barely got in. And anyway, it was only uh, 30 minutes or something. And, and Joshua was born. She actually, we were praying for a painless childbirth and she actually fell asleep. They had to wake her up and, and place Joshua on her, on her belly and say, here's your son. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, we, we hadn't slept much. And so after the birth is about nine o'clock in the morning or something, I was going to go back to Jamie's parents' house where we were staying and the car was out of gas. And so I just coasted into this gas station and sat there for a while and uh, praying, God, what do I do? And I, I'm not recommending this, but I just filled up the car. This, for those of you that are young, this is back when you used to pump the gas yourself and then you would go in and pay for it that you didn't use a credit card. And so I just pumped the gas and I thought, what's gonna happen? They're gonna put me in jail. I don't have any money. And we didn't have a credit card. I mean, I had zero money. I didn't have a penny. I didn't have anything. And rather than do that and then drive off and steal it, I went in to tell the guy. I said, look, I'm, I was gonna tell him, I'm, I'm sorry, but I don't have any money. 
And before I could say anything, when I walked in, it was a guy that had come to one of my Bible studies two years before. And he says, what are you doing over here in Arlington? I said, well, my son was just born this morning, just about an hour ago. And he says, oh, great. Well, let me buy this tank of gas for you. And he paid for my gas. Praise God. But man, that's just, we went through about six years of poverty that was totally unnecessary. And it's not that I mind working. I don't mind working. I, it would have been a lot easier to work. I honestly thought I was doing what God told me to do. And I put myself and Jamie through a lot of hardship that was totally unnecessary because I thought that if you're called to the ministry, you're sinning against God if you go work a job. So I read these verses just to tell you that no, it says that when you preach the gospel, you should live of the gospel. If you're preaching the gospel to two or three people a week, you shouldn't expect to live full time of the gospel. If you're preaching part time, then you should expect to work part time. You should not be expecting God to supply all of your need. You know, in a sense, I think I've talked about these things before, but when, in a sense, when you minister the word, that's work. And if you are only ministering a tiny bit, well, then you're only working a tiny bit and you should not be expecting to get a full-time wage out of it. When you get to where you're working full-time and you don't have time, you would have to slack on your ministry in order to uh, go out and work. Well, then you can expect to live full-time of it. You know, that was when we uh, first moved to Seagoville, Texas, and we stayed there for two years and struggled for two years there. And then we went to Childress, Texas. It's a miracle how we got there, supernatural, how God called me to Childress. But in Childress, I started working a little bit, just out of desperation, because by then we had our second child uh, uh, when we were in Childress, Texas. So we had two kids and... Uh, I really was of the same mindset. I hadn't seen this yet, but we, uh, we needed a place to meet and we had this house that could seat a hundred people in this addition. And so anyway, we rented this house and I forgot how much it was, but it was a stretch for us to rent it. And then the landlord came to me and he says, I'm going to sell this house and you've either got to leave or buy it. And I said, I hadn't got any money to buy it. And he said, well, I'll let you uh, just lease it. And your, your uh, payments, instead of rent, it'll go towards the thing. There was nothing down. So anyway, we wound up buying this house with no money down and just paying the same uh, lease. And we did that so we could hold church there. We had about 60 people coming to church in, um, in Childress. But I got behind there. I didn't have enough money and I wouldn't tell, the people didn't know. I didn't take a salary from the church and nobody knew that we needed any money. And so uh, anyway, we got behind and I went to my landlord, this guy that I owed the money to and told him, I said, look, I, I, it was the day that the rent was due. The payment was due. I, I encourage you, if you do get behind, if you will go to the people that you owe the money to and tell them the truth and show them that, look, you mean to pay for this. I told him, I said, my wife's blood is worth $150 an ounce. She's got a B negative blood. It's expensive. I said, man, if have to, we'll just take some blood. We will get you paid. I said, some way or another, I was joking. But because uh, I was up front and told the guy, I didn't try and avoid him. He knew I was serious. And anyway, he contacted me and he owned a photography studio. And he says, I'll let you work it out. He says, you can work it off. And I didn't want to because I thought I'm called to the ministry. I shouldn't be working. But um, I owed the guy money. I couldn't tell him no. And so anyway, I was kind of forced into working. And within just a couple of months, I actually saved this guy's business. He was losing his business. He had shot all of the high school pictures and the people that developed pictures for him had quit. And he didn't have anybody to develop pictures. He was having to do it himself and he couldn't uh, take in new clients and do their photos and stuff. So anyway, he was losing his business and I came and uh, he said I was doing things that he had been doing this for 26 years and he had never seen anybody who had done this one thing that I did. He said, you couldn't do that again if your life depended on it. And I took him into a room and showed him about 150 of those things that I'd done that way. And he says, I don't know what you're doing, but whatever you're doing, he says, just keep doing it. 
And uh, this guy would hug me every once in a while. He says, you've saved my life. And he offered me 50% of his business within two months, made me a part owner in it. And I had to tell him, no, I'm called to the ministry. I turned him down and didn't do it. But anyway, that's what got me to start a kind of uh, working a little bit is I was forced into it. And then when we went to Pritchett two years later, so it was only about, I guess, four years of absolute poverty. It seemed like 40. <laughs> but um, anyway, when I went to Pritchett, I had people coming by day and night. I mean, it got to where there was literally days that we could not eat because we were so busy ministering to people and we were uh, seeing awesome results. And I was traveling in three states and Anyway, I got to where I couldn't have worked. And did you know at that time, uh, we didn't receive an offering from the church, which again is not what I would encourage you to do, but I didn't receive any money from the church. We never passed an offering bucket. We never asked for anything. We didn't have a bucket at the back. We didn't do anything. If you give, you can give. If you don't, don't do anything. And anyway, I was getting about 6,000 a month and this was back in the 70s. And so that, that was pretty good. And, I, and so when I got to where I was ministering full time, then God started meeting my needs full time. So basically, I was just wanting to share with you my negative experiences today to illustrate to you that if you feel like God has called you into the ministry, you need to take the pressure off of yourself, off of your family, off of the people that you're ministering to, and not just expect God to supply your need uh, out of thin air. You minister and you get paid proportional to the ministry that you're doing. If you're ministering to just virtually nobody, it doesn't matter if you're called and anointed or not. You get paid based on how you minister to people. You know, now we have over 5 billion people that can watch my program per day. And not all of those give. As a matter of fact, very, 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 very few of them give. <laughs> We have 63,000 partners. And of course we have other people that give occasionally, but we have, if you just look at 1% of that 5 billion, that would be 50 million people that probably see me on television per day. And if, if they gave $1 a day, that'd be $50 million a day. Man, we don't even come close to that. We average somewhere around 200,000, a little over $200,000 a day and that's weekdays. If you average it out, it's probably less than that. And so we have a very small percentage of the people that I minister to that give, but uh, because I minister to so many people, now our needs are met and there's just no problem to it. In a sense, it's like going to a bank. You can't make a withdrawal until you've made a deposit. Until you have spoken into a person's life, you should not expect them to give to you. Now, there are exceptions to this. There is benevolence giving. Benevolence giving is where the person hasn't ministered to you, but they're in need. And, and the scripture says over in James chapter two, if you see your brother or sister in need, and if you shut up your bowels of compassion towards them, how dwells the love of God in you? So there is just benevolence giving. There is giving to the poor. There is giving out of mercy but you aren't, you aren't supposed to live off of that. Nobody should expect just mercy giving that people support you when you aren't ministering to them. It can happen occasionally, but God does not want you to live that way. You're a moocher. You're a taker instead of a giver. Other people would say that nicer than what I just did, but hopefully you got my point that you aren't supposed to be a taker. You're supposed to be a giver. And if you aren't if you aren't contributing, if you aren't speaking into people's lives, if you aren't helping them, if you don't have a service or a product that you are selling to people, well, then you shouldn't expect people to give you anything. This whole mindset that some people have, a, a welfare mindset that everybody owes me something. We don't owe you anything. This whole thing that they're talking about in San Francisco where they're talking about giving $5 million to all of the blacks in San Francisco, that is demonic. That's wrong, 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 wrong. None of them were ever slaves. And did you know that California never improved slavery? They were against it. It was a free state. And if you're gonna do reparations, what about the 675,000 white people that died in the Civil War giving the slaves their freedom? Are you gonna pay reparations to them? 
This is against scriptural principles that says that the children are not supposed to suffer for the parents' sins. And to sit there and do that today, that is a wrong attitude. But there's some people that just think everybody owes me something. Nobody owes you anything. Thank you for those few amens. I know what I'm saying goes contrary. And there's a lot of people that just think that everybody's supposed to give to you. And we, I don't know of any of this happening here right now. I hope it isn't, but in the past it has happened. It's when you get people together, this is the way things happen. But we've had people in the past that just come around and they drop little hints about how hungry they are, about they may have to leave school, they don't have their rent, and they're just always dropping hints, hoping that somebody will just give them to them. You're panhandling. You're a Christian beggar. The Bible says, I have never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed out begging bread. For you to be begging is ungodly. Work. Go do something. Set your hand unto something. The Bible says, Deuteronomy chapter 28, I believe it's around verse 12, somewhere it says that uh, the Lord will bless what you set your hand unto. You set your hand to zero, a hundred times zero is zero. Go work. Go do something. I had one man that came to me and he was, he was about to get evicted from his house. He was losing everything and he came to me and he says, man, I, why isn't it working? He says, I pay my tithes, I do all of these things and I just can't seem to uh, prosper. And, I, and I, I asked him what his situation was. He'd been unemployed for 18 months and he only lived, you know, they have... Uh, welfare or unemployment. I forget now they've extended it indefinitely, I guess. I don't know. But anyway, you know, Jamie and I could have gotten food stamps, welfare, our first six years of marriage. We wouldn't have done that. I wouldn't, you couldn't have forced me to do that. I'd have never gone and asked somebody to give me some. That's the righteous begging for bread. I may not have known very much, but I wasn't going to sit there and go out with my hand out. Matter of fact, when we dedicated our building down in Colorado Springs, and it was the first really big building that we had done, $3.2 million debt free. And we had a dedication service and we were celebrating. I was up on the stage and talking about how that we came from nothing and that we couldn't do this. And that we even went, Jamie went uh, two weeks without any food when she was eight months pregnant. My daddy-in-law was at the service and walked up on the platform and rebuked me and said, if you would have let us know we'd have taken care of you, make us look bad. And but nobody ever knew what was going on. So anyway, I had this guy that he, he had been 18 months with no work. And, and I said, well, have you tried to get a job? And he said, yeah, I put in application. I said, where are you putting in application? And he'd been a CEO of a company. And so he was used to making six figures and he was applying to be a new CEO. And for 18 months, he had made applications and couldn't get a job. And I said, go down to Walmart and get a job being a greeter. He says, but I've been a CEO. That's beneath me. He says, that's not, and I said, look, if you would have had a Walmart job for the last 18 months, would you be in the situation you're in? And he said, well, no. And I said, go do something. God, you put your hand to something. God can bless it, but you do nothing. You are not going to receive God's blessing on you doing nothing. And anyway, this guy went and got a job at Walmart. And I don't know what the results of it is, but he never came back. Either he didn't like my counsel or I believe that God prospered him. If something was to happen to me, I could go get a job at McDonald's. And I guarantee you, I would pray over it. I would be the best worker they ever had. It wouldn't be long until I'd be managing that McDonald's, until I'd own McDonald's. You know, Andrew Wirtz, some of you know him. He's the senior vice president of our ministry. And he left a very good paying job and everything to come here. And so when he came here, instead of doing nothing, he just started working at 7-Eleven, the graveyard shift all night long. Did you know within a year and a half, he was the manager over seven states of 7-Elevens. A guy who just started working the graveyard shift. He had thousands of employees under him and making money hand over fist. And then he quit that to come to work for me. And I'm telling you, do something. I'm telling you from experience, this is my probably biggest mistake I've ever made in ministry. That if you're gonna minister, well, that's a great thing, but until you get to where you can't do anything else, you ought to go out and work. You ought to be a contributor instead of a beggar. 
And more, if I'd have done that, it would have taken a lot of pressure off of us. And like I said, Jamie never complained. Praise God for Jamie. But it affected her. And Jamie, man, she, to this day, man, when I, when I want to do some stuff, Jamie will look at me, are you sure? I put her through a lot of stuff. And to this day, man, she, uh, she deals sometimes with insecurity. Like I lived in a bunker for 13 months in Vietnam and I was happy as I could be. So it didn't bother me, but man, I put Jamie through some things that I still uh, reap negative effects sometimes because of the way I treated her and stuff like that. You don't want to do this. So anyway, since today's my son's 45th, 49th birthday, I was thinking about all of that and just thinking it might help you to hear how dumb I was. <laughs> and hopefully it'll help you to not make some of the same mistakes. I tell you, work is a great thing. And when you're ministering the gospel, you're working. You know, this, this last couple of weeks, I got so tired that, man, I slept, I think, 11 hours one night and woke up just as tired as when I went to bed. And it took a couple of days over the weekend to catch up. And so I'm working. I, I spend typically 12 hours here. And tonight, it'll be about 12 hours. I'll get through around 7 o'clock tonight. I've got things going till then. And then, uh, anyway, I'm working. It's work. It may not be physical work, but it's work. You're ministering. When you're ministering the gospel, it takes effort. Yes, sir. And um, so if you're ministering the gospel, it is fine for you to receive your finances from the gospel. But even if you're called, if you don't have many people coming, please learn something through my mistakes and just go work a job. Amen. It's, it's so much simpler. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen. So we're going to receive an offering. Let's pass out the offering um, envelopes. And I've sown into your life. And so it's a normal thing that if you sow a, into a person's life, you give back financially. This money doesn't, doesn't go to me directly. This stays in Karis Bible College. It goes towards our missions trips and other things that we're doing. And um, so you're sowing into your future Amen. as you give. You know, I had a lady that uh, was like a spiritual mentor to me that wrote me a letter during this time when we were living with my mother. I remember exactly when I got it. And she was using 2 Thessalonians 3.10 that if you don't work, don't eat. Yes, yeah. And she wrote that letter and said, you're of the devil. You're being deceived by God. And the way she approached me, I remember burning that letter saying, I refuse every bit of this because I wasn't of the devil and I wasn't rebelling against God. My heart was right, but my head was wrong. If somebody would approach me with just a little bit of wisdom and maybe compassion, maybe I'd have received earlier. But um, anyway, I should have known better. I didn't. But praise God for grace and mercy. And I've learned some things. And you know, now when we have needs, like we need all of this building that we're going to be doing, I've realized that it doesn't just come out of thin air. It's not a matter of me just praying and then God just gives it to me. I'm not looking for one person to give me a billion dollars or whatever. I'm looking to the people that I minister to. I've sown into their life. Now I need to receive back. And part of it is, that you have to let people know what the need is. We've still got a few minutes, so let me give this illustration that when I first started learning these things, um, we were in a real bind financially. I actually struggled until the 90s. It was probably 96 is when I first started getting to where we could breathe easy, where we had our bills paid. We had bill collectors after us because of my stinking thinking. And anyway, I had... Uh, I had a need. I forgot how much the need was. Now, the ministry was small back then, so I think it was $15,000 or something that we were behind. But that was probably two or three months' income. And uh, we were struggling. And I didn't know what to do. And I had a dream. And in this dream, I, went, I was in Dallas, Texas, and one of my partners that I knew came up and 
said, how are you? And I said, I'm blessed. And he said, I know you're blessed, but how are you financially? And I said, well, and I, I didn't say much. And he said, look, I'm your partner. I, God told me to help you. What are your needs? And since he asked me straight out, I just told him and he got on my case. And he said, God told me to help you and you are not giving me the information that I need. He says, I'm not asking you to beg or to write a bad letter manipulating, but you need to give your partners enough information to know what your needs are. And I felt like that was the Lord. So when I woke up, I wrote a two or three paragraph thing. And typically I would have put a return envelope in there. I didn't even do that. I didn't want it to be perceived as manipulation. I just told the people, I said, look, God rebuked me, told me I need to let you know, here's the need. You can do with it what you want to. And anyway, we only had 1,500 partners back at that time. And in two weeks, we had $53,000 come in, which was probably close to a year's income for us just because I said something. I didn't manipulate them or beg. I just let people know. And so that's what I do nowadays. Basically, I don't ever ask for finances over the television other than, you know, here's a thing we're going to give you and it's uh, for suggested donation, but you can give whatever. And we'll just encourage people to give a little bit. But the only people we tell our needs are our partners. And uh, those are people that have already uh, received. They've written in, they've received material. I know that I've sown into their life. And so those are the only people that I usually make an appeal to. Now the Lord has told me that we've got millions of people out there that watch me and have received that have never written in and I need to at least let them know. So the last uh, 10 days, I've been putting in a little two minute clip on my program. And so I'm beginning to, I'm still growing, amen. I'm still learning. But uh, basically we, we don't pressure people, but when you sow into a person's life, it is scriptural for them to give back to you, amen. So Father, we receive this offering today with thanksgiving. I thank you, Father, that you are helping these students here not to make the same mistake that I made. Father, if they can benefit through my negative experiences, I pray that you'd use this to help them, that they would not do these things to themselves and to their family. And so we thank you, Father, and I believe that we can benefit from this. So as we give today, I believe that you are blessing this back to every single person that gives, that you are supplying our needs supernaturally. And that, Father, we are not going to be in the situation that I found myself in. I thank you for abundance coming upon every single person, Father. We agree and we receive that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. You can receive the offering. Amen. Man, I tell you, to think of where I've been and where I am is just un... There's no way to explain any of this but God. There is no way. And you know, on Thursday will be the 55th anniversary of the night the Lord changed my life. And uh, man, I had no idea where God would be taking me and what he would be doing. But I tell you what, it's better than you could ask or think. And the same thing is true for every single person. It's not like God <laughs> likes me more than he likes anybody else. I believe that God's plans for me are much greater than I have ever experienced. Nobody has ever tapped God out, but you can limit God by your small thinking. Hopefully me sharing the things that I've shared will help you to understand that if God will do this for me, praise God, he can do it for anybody in here. And if you've messed up and if you've made mistakes, man, you can't make, I was with a group of preachers one time and they were talking about how they committed adultery on their wife and they were telling about terrible things that they did. And then I told about some of our poverty things and these guys said, man, what you did to Jamie is worse than I ever did to my wife. <laughs> and in a way that's true. And yet God has blessed us and praise God, we're still together. That's awesome. So, uh, if God can do it for me, God can do it for anybody in here. Hopefully this will encourage you. Thank you, sir. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Man, God is good. I'm going to let you go 20 seconds early. You're dismissed.
to the 